Welcome to Everything STEAM. I'm your host, Sam Stanford. As a physicist and structural engineer with Jacobs Engineering, I've made many connections with some bright individuals who are either working, studying, or self-taught and passionate about our particular topics of discussion. Chemistry is a fundamental study of macroscopic interactions at the microscopic scale, at least in our way of viewing reality. So to kick off this episode, we will cover what chemistry is in further depth and address the timeline of its development. As we progress, we'll highlight organic chemistry and what is specifically done in my guest's laboratory. And then to end on a light note, you'll catch some information and advice on lab management in STEAM with a fun comparison of labs in pop culture versus labs in, well, the real world. So to give you a better appreciation and cover all of this material correctly, I brought in chemist Tamara El Hayek Ewing. Tamara is a lab manager at Scripps Research Institute and shares her passion for chemistry through science communication and art on Instagram and TikTok under the handle Chemistee. She discovered a love for chemistry as a high schooler, but didn't really realize how exciting it was until she had to make it interesting for teenagers as a high school teacher herself. So following a short teaching career, she ventured back to school as a first generation graduate student and earned a master's in chemistry, which helped her land her current position. In this position, her role is to support her lab group and make sure they have everything that they need to accomplish their goals of synthesizing natural products and performing electrochemistry methodology studies. Her love for chemistry has opened many doors for her and she hopes to continue sharing her story so that others who are just as passionate about STEAM can be inspired to pursue their dreams as well. So, now that you've been introduced to my guest star and the topic of this podcast, we're going to head into our first segment where we will dive into chemistry and its rich history. Cheers. Tomorrow, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Hi, Sam. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you today about all things chemistry. That's right. Yeah, this is our first chemistry podcast. So congratulations on that one. Ooh, a lot of pressure. An honor, but a lot of pressure. No, no, don't don't worry about it. So this is your first podcast? Not my first podcast. Um, I've done one before uh, with another uh, like an academic institution, also talking about a, kind of what I do and a little bit about chemistry and teaching actually as well. Okay. So this might be a little more laxed. I would hope so. <laughs> I'm not an institution. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit more chemistry heavy, definitely, but everything I'm excited about. So it's not, it's not going to be boring. That's for sure. Well, that's good to hear. So this first segment, we're going to be talking about like of course, like the chemistry 101 kind of thing, we're going to go over what is chemistry, which is not going to be as boring as what you think. So stick around for it. And <laughs> we're, also going to, we're also going to be highlighting the timeline of chemistry, which in my opinion is really fascinating. And it brings like a little storybook-esque kind of approach to the podcast. But I want to start out before we get into any of that and just kind of highlight the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Can you run me through the well, first the people that received, and then also what they or why they received Nobel Prize? Yeah, so really exciting for a couple of reasons. Uh, the The prize this year was awarded to Carol Bartosi, Morton Meldal, and Barry Sharpless, and they are obviously very fascinating chemists to have won this prize in the first place. But an interesting fact about uh, Carolyn Bartosi is she is the first um, lesbian woman to win the prize ever in chemistry, and she's the only the eighth eighth woman ever to win the prize in chemistry. So that's really great and exciting for her. And then the other really interesting fact is that Barry Sharpless is the fifth person ever to have won the Nobel Prize twice wow. in the entire history of the Nobel Prize. So really amazing recipients. Um, and they won the prize this year for, so Meldal and Sharpless won it for a concept of developing a concept of click chemistry, which is essentially the perfect synthetic reaction that's super straightforward. It's cheap, it's efficient, it's no side reactions that are negative, And it's just like the best type of reaction you could possibly have. And they were investigating that with um, some pretty unique molecules that sort of click together, literally click together like a seatbelt is the imagery that they use a lot of. 
And then Carolyn Bertozzi took that concept and she applied it to biological systems. And what she's using it for currently is to study ways of breaking down glycans, which are like sugar molecules that attach to cells. And in um, biological systems, they can actually prevent our bodies from breaking down tumor cells. So she is working on ways to attack these glycans and remove them and break them down so that our bodies can maybe um, fight off tumor cells. And so they're, the pharmaceuticals that they developed using this chemistry are now in clinical tri trials to hopefully um, help cure some advanced cancer patients. So very cool chemistry and then applied in an awesome way to hopefully move us into a new world of uh, pharmaceuticals and medicine that is really, really beneficial. Wow. That's really awesome. And I, I hate to strip that. Like that's, that's beautiful. But I, my, my simple brain just wants to jump back really quick and sure. ask about the click chemistry. So you're saying that this is a synthetic reaction that doesn't have like a byproduct of like H2O or, or carbon dioxide or anything like that. Is that what you're saying? So in the model reaction, no, I can't say for sure all the click reactions don't have any byproducts whatsoever, mm -hmm. but the byproducts that are formed are essentially benign. They are not going to affect sort of anything else in the reaction. So generally when you have synthetic reactions, you have all of these side products, you have dimers or things reacting with themselves, you have like just unwanted things going on. Whereas with this chemistry, everything, the, the product that you are looking for is the only product that's formed. Everything else in the outside could be like a water byproduct or carbon dioxide, but it's not something you're interested in and it's not something that's going to affect the rest of the system. Oh, okay. I got you. That's and there's like a ton, there's a ton of really stringent requirements for something to be considered a click reaction. And they're very, very strict which is why anything that does fall into these categories is why we're talking about it like a perfect synthetic reaction. Like there's just this long list of like ideality that you would want for this, for these types of reactions to occur. That's really cool. And I, I think you'll get a, like a sense of scale whenever we talk about it here in a little bit, because like, that's really extraordinary if they can narrow-mindedly create these synthetic reactions and literally just a pool, a cesspool of, of vibrating molecules and atoms in space. It's yeah. super impressive. Yeah, <laughs> very, very fascinating. And they developed it back in 2001, but it being applied now to like actual cancer treatments and it getting to the point where it's being developed to have really, really impactful uses. There's other uses outside of the body, but like this is such an important one that it's just crazy. In two decades, we've reached this point who knows where it'll go from here. Mm, that's impressive. It also goes along with the the exponential, I guess, increase of technological advancement. Yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah. We'll talk about that in a little bit when we talk about the history of chemistry and kind of how it exploded, you know, oh. out to hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years. And then like in the last 200, 300 years, we just see this crazy exponential growth in development. Absolutely. So I guess we might as well move forward and jump to the most basic question I can ask you being that you're a chemist. <laughs> so yes. uh, the million dollar question is, what is chemistry? How would you define chemistry? And then we'll get into the weeds of things. Sure. So chemistry is really just the study of atoms, molecules, and all of their interactions. So we just take, like, you can get as granular as you need to, and it is what is the world made out of physically and how does it interact with itself and with other things. And anything that studies that is going to be chemistry. Matter matters. Matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just a step up from uh, physics, I would say. So, like, I, I say it in a, in a like a cute little chain that that physics creates chemistry, chemistry creates biology, biology creates life. That yeah. that kind of and a cheesy little thing. The language of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, you know, there's a really awesome sense of scale as well with the. The, the basic building blocks of chemistry, right? You have atoms or the, the element, the elemental size, 
quote unquote. Obviously, there's things that are smaller, and we found that over time, but right. we named it as an element. And the, the sense of scale is so impressive. Maybe I can give a, a quick example. So an atom can be about two picometers. And if you know anything about the metric scale, uh, a picometer is 10 to the negative 12 meters. So if you took a meter and you divided it by a trillion, that's what you would have. That would be a picometer. And that's unbelievably small. Of course, you <laughs> wouldn't be able to see that with your naked eye. <laughs> um, but so in a sense of scale, if if you have uh, Tamara and I, and she shrunk me down to the size of an atom, she would be two trillion times larger. And if you, if she, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard to really explain from that. But like, if a she- trillion, a huge number, it's like so hard to conceptualize. It is, it is. It's a, uh, you know, a thousand times bi uh, bigger than a billion. So if tomorrow then, if we were, looking at a sense of scale say we were both standing on earth and she was 12 2 trillion times taller than i am she could stretch her arms out and touch the sun and touch saturn at the same wow. time that's yeah. a really fun that's a really fun visualization <laughs> it, it is it is and a couple other things that i really love about the atomic scale is that i like to say this a lot in that the the atom is about 99 0.9% empty space. And <laughs> really cool. So if you took all about 8 billion people on on planet Earth and shrunk them down, packed them into the subatomic particles of, you know, the, the proton, the neutron and the electrons, pushed them all together, you get all of us being about the size of a sugar cube. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All uh, of us. So yeah. crazy to think. It, it really is. It's all uh, lovely electromagnetism, of course, with some weak force going on there, of course, with radioactive decay, and then as, as well as the strong force holding the nucleus or the nuclei together. Uh, one more thing I, I quickly want to go over is, and, and of course, then I'll hand it back over to you. I'm just, I'm just. Uh, I, I, lo I love these facts. These are not. I'm very fascinated. <laughs> I'm going off over here. <laughs> so. Uh, Getting a little physics e, I guess. One thing that you learned in high school, the typical person would learn in high school, is that the Bohr model is something of which you would understand an atom to look like. You have these set orbitals of electrons that, whenever, say, a collision occurs, they get energy added to the system and they jump up, and or they would like feel some attraction repulsion between other uh, elements or other molecules that are around them in space. But essentially, it's not like these set precursor um, paths that you would see in a, Neil, a Niels Bohr uh, atomic model. It's more like a cloud. And the cloud is <laughs> very, very interesting. So like, in a sense of scale, the electron cloud has a diameter comparable to the size of the Eiffel Tower relative to your height if you were the nucleus. Mm -hmm. And essentially because of the way quantum mechanics works is that an electron like position and its uh, energy and, 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 other, and other sort of um, measurables are uncertain until they are measured, which is really interesting. So that's why we call it the cloud. It could be anywhere in there until there's some sort of- of it existing. <laughs> yeah, so we call it a, a beautiful electron cloud rather than these boring orbitals. So right. yes, it's <laughs> not a set ring going around a, a nucleus a, my, quantum, my quantum chemistry professor once told us that we should be more surprised that the periodic table can even exist with how little we know about atoms and molecules and the world around us we should be in infinite awe that we were able to find any patterns because there's so much uncertainty especially the more you get into quantum mechanics and the more you get into subatomic particles and dark matter and all that well beyond the scope of my knowledge conversation but he's like yeah the fact that we even understand this much is absolutely bizarre once you get down to it yeah it's impeccable and also just how early 
we started to formulate the the periodic table. I'm sure we'll get into that here in a little bit, but uh, I also kind of want to jump over to the molecular scale, if you don't mind, just really yeah, quick. Yeah. And then I'm hand I'm handing the reins over. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. You're adding, you're adding a colorful context to all the chemistry we're going to talk about. There's uh, all the scale helps us really appreciate the fact that we are studying these things, and we can barely barely understand their size. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's insane. So uh, I started out with a sense of scale, of course, with the atomic, the atomic level. Now, like I was kind of alluding to earlier, we have these attraction repulsion uh, forces between different elements or like elements or uh, different molecules. You end up, excuse me, you end up getting molecules, right? Based on these, um, these attractions and repulsions. Now, if you think of it in the sense of scale, a molecule can be anywhere to several to a hundred to a few hundred angstroms and angstrom is about 0.1 to two nanometers and a nanometer is if you took again one meter and divided it by a billion you would get a nanometer so it's like 10 to the negative nine um and if you look at say a water droplet like you, you have a little uh, water droplet on your finger. There's roughly about a sextillion water molecules in one droplet of water. And that's about 10 to the 21st. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Inconceivable. Uh, yeah, I, that's that's a crazy number. And that's just, you know, how microscopic but macroscopic it is. If you went to the microscopic scale compared to us, everything would just be so uh, randomly, like, I don't want to say collected. There's so many things going on in yeah. just a, a little water droplet, which is really cool. Um, water. <laughs> yeah. And my last thing I'm going to say is that if you were to like jump to this level, you know, everything's vibrating, everything's gaining energy or, you know, losing energy by, by charges or the repelling or attracting away from each other it's it's there's just vibrations going on everywhere it's it's mm -hmm. so it's so hard to explain just via words i wish i could literally draw you a picture <laughs> because we're on a, a podcast just on a side note because this is so related and it's not yeah. chemistry but it is physics and you might find it interesting and your listeners might find it interesting have you heard of a book called mr tompkins <laughs> no it is a book that was written as if quantum mechanics at the subatomic level were applied to the macroscopic scale. So it is a, essentially like it, there's drawings in there, but it's a storytelling experience. It's the best way to put it of what we would experience if certain principles that happened uh, at the subatomic level were expanded to our existence. And it really helps sort of frame and put into context some of the weird things that happen that we can't really conceptualize and it uses like just everyday interactions. I think you would find it really fascinating. I will definitely send you like a Amazon link to it later. Yeah. But. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just like how we talked about before the podcast, you know, just another book to to have on our to read list. <laughs> After ourselves. I have I have both versions. So I have they're they're on here and I'll I'll happily suggest to, to you to keep them. No, I appreciate that. So I think we I guess established a sense of scale roughly. I mean, of course, excuse my um my I don't know if I maybe communicated that correctly. If anything, just go back and watch it again. It's it's all the information's there for sure. <laughs> it was more physics, I think, than um than chemistry. Actually, but we just start there. me like a deeper appreciation because I don't often think about it in that context. So yeah, it's it's very very small scale. It's very fascinating, and we are we are essentially atoms observing ourselves. So it is cool to think of it as that small. Yeah, we're just a way for uh, I guess the universe to know itself. Right. Yeah, I just quoted Neil Tyson. I, <laughs> Neil, <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> the man. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So, um, I don't know if you want to maybe transition to the next portion of this and talk about the history and or the timeline 
of chemistry and it's it's pretty interesting and it has a very long lineage so if you want to take the reins yeah sure so in preparation for this i kind of just started digging into like how far back does chemistry really go and it actually took me quite a bit of time to synthesize all of this information which you know i kind of knew a little bit about it but it's very very in-depth so I sort of split the timeline of chemistry into three segments. There's the sort of pre-chemistry, which is all of the philosophers and the, the era of uh, Aristotle and Democritus. And then we sort of transition into alchemy, which is like quasi-science. There's there is some observation and understanding, but it's not, it's still there's still some mysticism about it. And mm -hmm. then we fully transition into what we would consider science today, which is the you know, reproducible, experimental, you know, way of going about observing the world around us. Mm -hmm. So we can start, let's start at, at the philosophers, which this was very fun for me to, to dig into because I am like, I'm such a chemistry person. Like all of this philosophizing and like historical stuff doesn't really appeal to me. But when I looked at it in the context of chemistry, I was like, wow, this is actually very very fascinating like history really jumped out at me when i put it in the context of chemistry as a as a chemist myself, as a chemist myself so what i found was that sort of way back when 430 bc was the earliest date i found um Leucippus and democritus uh sort of came up with this idea that the world was made up of small particles that they actually coined as the term atoms or atomos and to them that literally translates to indivisible and they said that the world is made up of these small units of matter um, that are spherical and they're perfect. This perfect sphere was a big concept in ancient Greece. Um, and that there were maybe different sizes of these spheres that correspond to different kinds of matter. But generally, this is where atoms originated from the concept. And even though there were like a lot of flaws with their original concept, this was like baseline starting point. Um, and so the big thing, the big reason why this was very impactful at the time was because it sort of combined two competing Grecian theories at the time, which was that there is uh, like these small particles that are not changing and they can sort of interact and change with other things. So the idea of an atom itself is sort of immutable, but with other atoms, they can actually combine and break apart. So then later on, Aristotle, Aristotle sort of took this idea and said, okay, well, maybe there are four main elements, which were the, you know, fire, air, water, earth. Yes. Yep. The last <laughs> airbender stuff. <laughs> yes. Avatar, the last airbender type stuff. <laughs> so of course, like this is not very scientific, but this is like the philosophy of science, like starting here. Um, Got to get somewhere, right? You, you have to start yeah. somewhere. You have to start somewhere. And this was a really, really good start. The idea, like the fact that somebody without any tools to think of or like actually observe the world, just like their own human brain and just literally thinking about things was able to say like these immutable particles like that, some creative thinking for sure. <laughs> like I don't know how I wouldn't probably be able to come up with something like close to that in my observation. So so that was sort of the philosophical framework. Mm -hmm. And then the next step, in my opinion, was the alchemist. So alchemy didn't really start to sort of take off or develop for another 1,500 years, 1,500 years of the idea of atoms before we were able to sort of turn it into something else. Um, and like I said, it was sort of a mix between scientific and philosophical ideas. So a lot of postulating and a little bit of observing. Um, but the main sort of feature of alchemy at this time was that there was this big push for humans to try to take worthless matter <laughs> and turn it into valuable matter. So like- Wasn't that metal. like, <laughs> wasn't that like the, the philosopher's stone or something like that? Yes. Like. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, all of that was happening at this time. And like gold was like this crazy valuable metal that they were like, if we could turn and like all this crap into gold, this would be like the best accomplishment of, of science or alchemy, like in history. <laughs> and what was, this was actually really interesting to me that I was sort of 
understanding as I was looking through this was that alchemists were present in sort of all the societies at the time. Um, I don't know, maybe I just had this misconception, but alchemy sort of fell in like the Roman Empire for me in Europe, but surprise to me, there was actually also going on in the Middle East and there was a huge, huge um, culture around scientific discovery and um, the Islamic golden age was very valuable in terms of pushing forth science and logic and observation. And there was a lot of studies done uh, during that time in the Middle East. So that was, yeah. Well, alchemy is, I think its origin is Arabic. Um, Yeah. Al is the, and then Kimai or Kimai. Yes. That is then chemistry. So the chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. I know, that. I know that. I have a Middle Eastern background. Um, don't come for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's cool that you say that because, like, yeah, alchemy was in so many different societies. Actually, there is a large debate out, uh, about this is that Isaac Newton was actually kind of an alchemist on the side as well with everything else that he had going on in his, his time. I mean, it, it kind of fell suit. Like, I mean, it was the 1600s. So, right. Like you're doing something of the science. You're probably an alchemist. <laughs> yeah. A, a really interesting fact about, I guess the alchemy age is that there was such a run in with the church where there was like, Oh, if you're doing alchemy, you're a sorcerer or, or, or like a witch or a whatever. Witch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they would code things in in different terms such that like if anybody got to their books they couldn't claim them to be mm-hmm. uh, an alchemist and wow. burn them at the stake or something like that so the the real issue is is that historians are having a hard time going well did, did this person find phosphorus or but or did right. this person you know like right. what's going on here <laughs> Exactly yeah. like a foreign language almost, like you're decrypting hieroglyphics or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's that's a very weird but interesting like piece of history where it was just like there was a guild of, of communication between different alchemists or just like we didn't want to communicate because I didn't want you to know my findings. <laughs> right. I this is actually I re- I feel like I remember reading about this uh sort of briefly when I was digging into it, and that's that's definitely uh, like I, I I'm so interested in it. I might go back and dig into it more because it's like this is the the story time of of how chemistry came about. There's so many fascinating pieces of history that like what got lost, what was gained, who is hiding what from who. It's like a <laughs> it's like a murder mystery almost. Yeah, definitely, and it, it's a it's a shame that they didn't realize that they were trying to make an e- like an element out of another element. They needed a little more energy for that. <laughs> <laughs> just, a, just a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, there's a there's a really interesting story. I forget what he was an Italian alchemist. I forget his name now because I was just doing a little bit of side research before this, mm-hmm. and he found phosphorus by boiling like he found like the salt like solid phosphorus by Mm -hmm. boiling i forget how many pounds of urine for days i was gonna say i know i know the story why don't i I remember his name (laughs) (laughs) but yeah yeah i mean like you're just doing it's it's you're just messing around and finding out i'm gonna save the cursing language (laughs) (laughs) mess around and find out is essentially the theme of this era (laughs) yeah i couldn't imagine like the townspeople being like why do you need all of this urine Uh, what are you doing (laughs) it's amazing that the dude didn't like die from carbon monoxide poisoning right like what i was amazing that i mean people definitely died early but it's amazing how long they survived despite everything (laughs) yeah with all the substances they were playing around with it's very impressive Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Tell me so, yeah, now so about alchemy, what, yeah. Alchemy kind of led us into 16th, 17th century. Um, and really the, the main thing that was lacking in the approach was something systematic where it was a very clear delineation of this is how we're observing. This is how we take notes. This is the, you know, we come up with the hypothesis and the question, and this is how we go about trying to understand things and reproducing experiments 
was a major issue. I think partially because of what you had talked about where there was a lot of secrecy, but also mm -hmm. partially because people were really just messing around and trying to find out there was not a systematic way to do things. So it wasn't reproducible. So in 1605, Sir Francis Bacon came up with the scientific method or what we would, you know, he would, we would say he's historically the father of the scientific um, method. And he wrote a book or he wrote a piece of work called The Proficience and the Advancement of Learning. And this is where he described essentially the, the way to do sort of scientific discovery. Um, and that was occurring sort of towards the end of the Renaissance and into the age of enlightenment, which was also the same sort of age as the scientific and chemical revolution, where people were starting to take these ideas and run with them and have reproducible experiments and sort of advance chemistry. And this is touching now on what we had mentioned before, where we're exponentially growing in advancements yeah. and people are able to reproduce things and people the more consistent findings. And it's just like taking off and taking off. Um, so one major, one major thing that sort of happened in this time in the 1700, in the 1700s was, um, Antoine and Marie Lavoisier, they were like major chemists. They were, you know, wealthy, well-known people. And their contribution was that they, um, came up with the law of conservation of mass. And this was hugely impactful because it sort of said that like, hey, what we're working with here, there's, it has to turn into something else. We're not just making stuff appear and disappear. And so mm -hmm. we can work within the confines of this concept and maybe understand a little bit more about what's going on. Um, at the same time, we also had Joseph Priestley. He, in, he investigated and discovered oxygen actually like the elemental oxygen. Um, and also other people are identifying atoms, the, you know, these, this is the core of this molecule or this element. We can't break this down any further. This is unique in all of these ways. Mm -hmm. um, people are also defining atomic models. What do we think these particles look like? Remember Democritus had suggested that they were, they were these spherical balls essentially. But we knew from experimentation that there was a little bit more to them. So models are coming out, Bohr's model of the atoms coming out. Um, and people are really thinking critically about what is the world around us? What is it made out of? What mm -hmm. are the differences? What are the similarities? How do things combine? Um, and then in the 1800s, a huge breakthrough was when Mendeleev published the periodic table. And that was essentially the collection of all the elements available and understood at the time. But the biggest contribution was the fact that the periodic table had predictive power. Mm -hmm. There was a pattern to it, right? The periodic table, every period, there was a similarity between all of the atoms in the same column. Mm -hmm. And so his crazy leap, his crazy jump of creativity was... I can actually leave spots blank on this table. And I am so confident that an element exists. We just haven't found it yet. Mm -hmm. I did that with several, several different elements where he left blank spots. And then years later, they were found. These elements were identified. And so this is huge, right? To have a theory that describes what we already know is one thing, but to have a theory that can predict what we're going to find is another level of understanding of you know what we're experiencing and what we're um, observing. Yeah. So that, so that was huge. That was like so fascinating. I think it's one of the coolest discussions about the history of chemistry is that we can have we had this thing, and without knowing we could predict it and we were able to to fill it out. So that that was really cool. Um, and then that's I mean that's only the eighteen hundreds. That's <laughs> hundred years. A hundred more years, we're in the 1900s, and we're like really diving in now. We've got 1901, we developed the, uh, sorry, let's go back, 1888, we start producing um, aluminum electrochemically. We understand enough about how to break down um, matter and turn it into like purified aluminum. Fantastic. This is 18, <laughs> the 1800s. 1901, we discover radicals. 1907, all, you know, over a hundred years ago, we developed the first plastic, which like took off in production. 
you know, for better, or for worse, we do have plastic problems now, but at the time it was very revolutionary and still we, you know, we still need plastic for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Um, 1928, we develop analytical chemistry, a way to, you know, have the technology to actually analyze what we're looking at in, the, in much deeper ways. Penicillin was developed in 1928. We have the first, you know, a, a major total synthesis by a black chemist, Percy Julian, um, 1935. We, then we have, you know, throughout all of these years, we have cleaning chemicals, paints, materials like nylon, carbon fiber, semiconductor chips you know, food chemistry is developing where we know how to make things taste better. We know what taste, you know, what things are contributing to taste. Um, we start to develop more technological or technologies like NMRs, MRIs, and all of these tools are going to help us identify molecules better, understand what we're looking at when we can't see it, right? We're talking, like you said before, <laughs> those, yeah, we can't see this stuff. How do we know what we're working with? And we're developing the machines continually to try to understand how to analyze those things better. So we get more into natural products too, anti-cancer drugs, thousands of inventions, discoveries, connections, and all of that, you know, in that 100 year span from, you know, late 1800s to current, I guess it's a little over a hundred years now, but huge exponential growth in chemistry. And like that essentially leads us to where we are today, which is continual discovery, more inventions, better ways to synthesize things, better ways to analyze things, just in a crazy amount of chemical knowledge that we did not have before. It, it's an exponential growth. And you're also celebrating like the times of which, you know, these, these people, even like, even like uh, Mendeleev, you know, you have all these people making interesting uh, and insightful pokes into the fabric of, of reality. And, you know, they're not always right, but the cool thing about science is you can take, say, a theory of the day and go, you know, the basis of this theory makes sense, but here, there's a hole here where this doesn't make sense. Let's expand this. Like not everything that Charles Darwin said was was correct, but he put us in a great position. Not everything that Newton said was correct, but he put us in a great position. That's why you have to follow the, pro the progression of the science rather than the person itself. Like, yeah, the person's story is really awesome and beautiful, but like the science is arguably even more beautiful than than the person itself. Yeah, I, I would I would say that most, well, I don't want to speak for other people, but I would say one of the most interesting things about science and one of the most beautiful things about science is that it should be completely independent of who is doing it. Because mm -hmm. science should speak for itself. Is it valuable? Is it interesting? Is it changing the world? Is it changing our understanding? Is it giving us more in-depth knowledge? That on its own has so much merit that does not matter who's doing it, which for me is the most like mm -hmm. eye-opening, inclusive, best thing you could be a part of. It's like, sure, there's there may be, you know, political things and whatever other motions in place that that are causing societal things that make science a little bit more difficult to access. But at its core, science is an everybody's game. It's what are you observing about the world around you? How do you mm -hmm. make sense of this space? And what tools do you have at your disposal to just be curious and just explore? I think it taps into such a core innate part of human beings to explore and understand. And for me, chemistry is the you know really cool because it's atoms and molecules and it makes a lot of sense to me. But any of the fields, you have that curiosity dri driving your progress. And that's the, the coolest part, I think. So, so like people that don't understand like the core definition of science, right? They allude it to also being, unfortunately, like history shows that it's in baked or with the like an imperialistic movement or a political movement or a religious movement. But really, I mean, the science is the science. And then, of course, there are then people within science that get influenced by other things that, you know, are within the reality. But science is, like you said, it is just defining or understanding what is you know around us like the the political social culture like the values of any given time period may direct mm -hmm. sort of what is valuable to investigate at any mm -hmm. given time but 
it's the investigation itself is so pure in you know in its own way where it's directed might have you know a lot of mm -hmm. conversation but in terms of doing the science itself i think it's one of the most pure exciting things you can investigate you just need to have a good grant writer that's what you need <laughs> yes yes how do i spin <laughs> what i'm interested in to be valuable to somebody else that is the key <laughs> yeah yeah exactly one more thing i just really want to drive home before we move on is that you know, the, the one of the core arguments is like, well, well, Darwin wasn't right about everything or or Newton wasn't right about everything. Like I said before, of course, you're not going to be right about everything. And, but even if like at the end of the day that, say, Mendeleev said, I'm renouncing science and I'm going to go praise I don't know, the boogeyman and, and uh, slaughter a lamb. I don't give a shit. <laughs> the science has already been created. And now we have people who are going, look at what over the spectrum, what, what he's introduced. Now let's take and deduce these things, break them out and see what makes sense. And, you know, what doesn't make sense and toss it out. Not everything's going to be set in stone forever. <laughs> <laughs> and it shouldn't, right? As as we learn more, it, the whole point is building off of the knowledge of previous people and questioning, like the whole, one of the big cores of science is to question. And I think we lose that a little bit because we are like, well, science is factual and this is not, well, of course it is, but it's not independent of flaws. Mm -hmm. And there's still, there still needs to be an air of skepticism to how you approach it. Because if you don't, if you start getting into more like blind faith in science, that's where you run into problems. And there's historical evidence of that happening where we were like so blind to the problems of science and the potential pitfalls that we started believing things that ended up not being factual and not being true in the long run. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the more that we question, the more that we look at science as an ever changing field the better we can appreciate it because yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of things that it's good for and it's right for. And certain things are, have proven themselves over and over to be true and consistent. And those are good things to hang on to, but it's also good to have that air of like, yeah, this could be wrong. I wonder why. And mm -hmm. keep that curiosity open and keep that, like, you know, that ability to, to question, just I wonder, I wonder why, I wonder if, I wonder what, and that's what keeps the doors open. That's what keeps the sort of investigation going, I think. Right. The relativity of wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that is a nice catchphrase. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So I think we've exhausted segment one. So whenever yeah. we come back, we're going to be talking about organic chemistry and what Tamara does in her lab. So stick around. We're back. This too. And we're going to be talking about organic chemistry. Uh, don't run away. Uh, it's cool. Stay here. It's not going to be crazy. Uh, everybody runs to the thought of organic chemistry, at least whenever we talked about it, like in, in physics club and stuff, we had a couple people that were like, yeah, I'm taking organic chemistry. And they were showing it and we're just like, whoa, yikes. <laughs> I only took, I only took chem one and two. Surprisingly, I did better in Chem 2 than I did in Chem 1. Don't ask me why. I was a freshman in Chem 1. But yeah, we're going to be talking about organic chemistry. And tomorrow is going to be talking about it, not me, because I didn't take that. But um, <laughs> tomorrow, tell me what, how, how does organic chemistry differ or branch away from the overarching thought of chemistry? Yeah, so I will try to keep it as light and airy as we can for a topic such as organic chemistry. Um, but really, organic chemistry is sort of simple as a definition. It's the chemistry that focuses on carbons and hydrogen specifically. So majority, a huge majority of molecules exist in this sort of sphere. And that's not to say we don't consider other important elements, but sort of carbon hydrogen is the the baseline um and so a big focus of organic chemistry is is molecules and building molecules and um and actually we do a little bit of that in our lab which we'll talk about in a second but yeah it's just so simple organic chemistry is just studying hydrocarbon that's it nothing to be afraid of <laughs> nice shout out to the fusion of stars the evolution of fusion of stars because without that 
We wouldn't be here talking about it. Let me tell you. We wouldn't be here. That's you right. are star stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So what are, I guess, some of the fields that are applicable within organic chemistry? So it's a little bit harder of a question, I think. Um, the ones that I'm familiar with are sort of the ones I've sort of dabbled in. Um, my master's thesis was in organometallic studies. So I was investigating sort of the use of gold in um, synthetic reactions and how its uh, state within the reaction affected the outcome of the reaction. Mm. This is like to put it so, so you like, were also trying to find the philosopher's stone was it was it the philosopher's stone the alchemy thing that we talked about earlier it into gold. <laughs> yeah. yeah it was actually it was, it was very interesting to i mean i wish I, I wish i had more time with it but yeah it was so organometallics is is a sort of subfield you could say where you you investigate um metallic elements like gold palladium copper ruthenium as these catalysts in organic reaction. So that's a, a subfield. Um, another major one, like I mentioned, is total synthesis, which is this, um, this study of essentially how can we make complex molecules. So nature is the blueprint. Nature is the archetype. She, in her glorious self, makes these beautiful molecules with such ease. Mm -hmm. And we as glunky chemists try to recreate some of the beautiful um, molecules in lab and we're only so good at it. So there's a huge um, community around total synthesis where being able to create these molecules can be really, really valuable, especially in, you know, developing uh, molecules that are, let's say, bioactive, for example. Um, so that's, I would say, probably another subcategory. <laughs> and then uh, the last one that I am um, sort of touched on, slash familiar with, is what we do in our lab, which is actually new to me, um, is the is this field of electrochemistry, which I guess really isn't organic chemistry, but we use the electrochemistry in application with organic chemistry, or total synthesis, rather. So I would say that that's maybe a part of it. You're kind of either making molecules or studying how to make molecules. Mm. I could simplify it down. Through impulse? Is that what you're saying? Like electrical impulse? Yeah, through using electricity, through using mm. a, a cell, a chemical cell. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, electromagnetism makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about magnetism, but I'm actually not very well, good at electro. <laughs> you might know more than me. <laughs> mm. You know, they're inter they're intertwined. They're beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, I actually only took physics one and two. So we are equal opposite in that way. Mm. I had to take electromagnetism. So much fun. e and &M. Good times. No. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, you can use magnets to create an electrical current if you want to and vice versa. It just depends on uh, the law. I think it is Ampere's law where you use. Yes, it is Ampere's law where you take and use coils to create a magnetic you know, force or magnetic attraction. And then I forget the other, dang it, but you can use it vice versa to create an electrical current. Darn it, I failed. I failed. But you <laughs> can the use it in the would be really proud of you, but maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Nah, that's okay. I, I can just tell you that the B field and E field are at a, um, at a 90 degree intersect. Perpendicular. So, All yeah. right. <laughs> I can at least tell you that. I know yes. something about a right hand rule. Yeah, 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 right. We used to call this the right hand gang whenever we were right in physics. Gang. The right hand gang. Yeah. We're so nerdy. We're so nerdy to do this. <laughs> yeah, because this was our like our pew pew, you know. Right, but, right, right. Yeah. Sorry to all the listeners who have no idea what's happening with our hand motions right now, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that makes me think of so many different like applications for synthesis. Now this may be really stupid, but something that's pretty cool and applicable to our last episode is, uh, I guess, synthesis of or organic compounds that are within something not decayed but preserved, like in mm -hmm. say something that's like a, a an early fossil, like something that you can still carbon date rather than something that's you know a little more 
um, kind of out of date in that sequencing. Maybe maybe something like that. That might be a really cool uh, application. But I mean, anything that involves, like you said, carbon and oxygen, you got you got a job, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. So what we do in our lab specifically, I guess we can sort of transition since we're talking about applications of total synthesis. Our lab yeah. focuses on uh, medicinal chemistry, uh, yeah. total syntheses. So molecules that are relevant in either pharmaceuticals or are natural products that have some antibiotic or um, let's say anti-cancer, just like some bioactivity that is relevant in that in those types of ways. And so we seek out these molecules or rather people publish about them. So there's the first step is to identify them. Mm -hmm. And you can extract a lot of these natural products from natural products, from plants mm -hmm. um, or animals or creatures. And then they do sort of biological studies on the individual molecules. And they can determine like if a molecule has a potential to be valuable in this way. Does it kill targeted cells? Is it antibacterial uh, in some ways? Does it have some other interesting bioactivity? And once those are identified, one, they're usually pretty complex molecules. And two, they're usually not produced in high enough quantities within the natural source itself. So that makes it very interesting to know if we could do it in the lab. Because there are, there are some molecules, let's say, for example, that you can extract from the plant and it's a straightforward extraction, you know, more straightforward than doing a total synthesis, I'd say. And you can get large quantities of it and there's no real need to do a synthetic route for it. Whereas in our cases, we're looking for molecules that are really hard to get in any other way. And can we develop a way to, to make them in the lab? And then mm -hmm. once we do that, we could you know, create sort of streamlined processes for making them on a larger scale. And then they could be used in therapeutics or pharmaceuticals or medicine or whatever. Um, and so there's, a, there's an underlying sort of value to having a molecule be able to be synthesized. But like I mentioned, they're very, it's very challenging. It's not, um, it's not straightforward. A lot of times these routes are extremely long taking you know, 10, 20 plus steps and each step being challenging in its own way, you can start with grams of material and end up with micro or milligrams of material. And, but this is the nature of it. So the more we can improve sort of on these steps, the better that overall process is, but there's also a value and a sort of pride in just being able to get to that final piece. Right. Yeah. You, remember, you, we talked about how molecules are based on nanometers. So if you have a gram of something, it's possible that you could have about a billion, uh, like maybe maybe a billion of um, of molecules in just like a small substance or something like that. If you I guess if you want to play around with scale. So it's you're looking at a lot. <laughs> right a big portion of sort of the investigations we do is can we create these natural products and can, can we be the first to do them? Can we be the mm -hmm. best at them? Are our routes and are they superior in, in some way? Can this be useful? So that's half of what our lab does. And then the other half of what our lab does is actually super fascinating with even more relatively recent types of chemistry, which is electro electrochemistry. So rather than using um, reagents or other molecules, we are harnessing electrical power to create these transformations and put these molecules together and sometimes break them apart. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually, in our lab, alongside ICA, which is a brand that creates these um, um, instruments for doing this type of chemistry, we developed those instruments within our lab oh, cool. because prior to a prior to like a more streamlined use of electrochemistry there was no foundational um reproducibility to it okay. because everybody's setups were sort, sort of different you would have a lot of variability in the utensils and the tools that were used and so recreating or reproducing electrochemical methods was very challenging 
And that needed to change if electrochemistry was going to become a more streamlined process. And it's still in the works of becoming more adopted amongst chemists because it's, again, it's fairly new. This is like within the last 20 years that this has been developed and, and brought up. Now, not to say that electrochemistry is brand new. I mentioned earlier in, his, in history, it was in 1888 that electrochemistry was used um, to refine aluminum. But to use it on the scale of total synthesis is relatively recent um, chemical advancement, I'll say. So yeah, so we developed in our lab the instruments to actually do this kind of chemistry on a, in a reproducible way. And we are actively investigating ways to make molecules more efficiently using this um, technology, which is really, I mean, it's really cool to feel like you're on the forefront of advancement and the things that you're discovering is just making people's lives better, making chemists' lives better, making, mm -hmm. you know, process chemists, people that are, you know, trying to build these molecules and build these medicines, just doing it in easier and more efficient ways and more green ways, more environmentally sustainable ways. Just all of that ties in with adopting this kind of um, thinking. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Run me through, I guess, a, a way of efficiency. So you're talking about voltage versus output of, of synthesis versus time, I would assume. So uh, a really good example is, let's say, a, a synthetic route, or you can take um, a target molecule, mm -hmm. like um, homotyrosine as, as an unnatural amino acid that we recently demonstrated could be created using electrochemical methods in one single step, single step, um, versus before it was actually a very challenging molecule to create and took, I think, I can't remember, if I think it was seven steps wow. to make this molecule. Um, and it, they weren't very efficient steps either. And they used very harsh um, reagents and it just was not an overall like very efficient process. And I think the value of homotyrosine was in terms of dollars was uh, I think around twelve hundred dollars a gram, and it's partially because it's challenging to make. There may be other factors like maybe it's not you know as you know in demand, but that could also be because of it's difficult to make. So there's a lot of things that go into that pricing. But mm -hmm. and that's when it takes you know it's twelve hundred dollars per gram of this molecule, and we were able to make it in a single step in a reaction that was um, not sensitive to air. So that's something you'll find in, in organic wow. reactions. You often have to be very careful that you don't introduce oxygen, that you don't have it open to the environment. Um, but we were able to do it open to air, really robust. You just stick it in this electrochemical um, instrument, you turn it on and you're able to generate it. Sort of one pot, mix it up, super easy. We like to joke that the, Hardest part or the longest part of doing this reaction in our methods is actually weighing out the chemicals on the balance. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> once you have it weighed out, you just dump it all in together, you mix it up and you get the, the molecule. And sort of building off of that, the one thing that I was directly involved in was uh, scaling this reaction up. So like I mentioned, these are interesting and valuable, but if we're not able to scale it up and we're not able to to demonstrate that you can take this chemistry and you can make a lot of this product, it's not in and of itself inherently that that special. Mm -hmm. But what I was, what we were able to show in our paper, and what I again, like I had a direct role in, is we took this electrochemistry, we scaled it up, and we were able to generate in, I think it was a sixteen total hours. Um, over 18 grams of this highly valuable product that before, again, was taking seven steps, really inefficient processes, and was almost inaccessible in a lot of ways. And we just dumped all the reagents in, we turned on the reactor, we let it sit for 16 hours, and then we worked it up and it was over 18 grams. So whatever, do that math in your head, there's just under... $20,000 worth of product in 16 hours, which would be unheard of trying to do it another way in that time frame. So you're saving wow. money, you're accessing molecules that are otherwise difficult to create. 
and you're doing it in a much more um, green, environmentally sustainable, and just like straightforward way. You're dumping and stirring. And so being able to take these methods and develop them further and apply them to other chemical spaces and other arenas is a huge focus of why we're investigating this. Because if we can apply this simple type chemistry to other complex processes, like that is, I think, the next level of doing this type of chemistry. I agree. So is this like someone coming to you like a, I don't know, like an agency saying, we have this problem. Uh, can you try to simplify it, make it more efficient um, in X, Y, and Z ways? Like we talked about, you know, being more sustainable, uh, taking less steps, less people hours, and just everything involved. Or is this something that you're like skimming or skimming through all of these papers saying, I think that we could take this based on our knowledge and based on like what we have in our lab and then we can kind of tackle this problem or is it like both um i would i would say it's a little bit of both so we work directly mm -hmm. with several pharmaceutical companies um and we consult with them often mm -hmm. weekly monthly just asking them to bring us their problems what are the real problems that you guys are facing what are the real issues in your industry right now because we as much as we you know would like to explore and investigate science for the sort of merit of it and the exploratory sense a big part of what the institute is about and in our lab in particular is translational science so we're the translational science like institute yeah. we want what we are doing to translate and to mean something impactful directly to the end user and so in order to know what that is, we have to consult with them. We have to ask them, like, what what are the problems? Like, what are you? What are we trying to deal with? What are the most pressing issues? And tell us what are the restrictions. Okay, if you want it this to be a, um, it's a drug candidate. In order to to be a good candidate, you can't have, you know, too many side reactions because every side product that is created or generated would have to go undergo its own testing regime. So that the more side products you have, the more costly, the more difficult it is to get this candidate approved. Um, is it, you know, in something that's going to go into the human body? So you can't use certain types of reagents, like certain metal catalysts, like copper or palladium. You can't, you can't <laughs> use because those eventually, these molecules are eventually going to end up in the human body. So can we do the same type of chemistry without those? sources or without those uh, catalysts and those additives and so mm -hmm. they present to us like all of these problems and restrictions and we say okay how can we get more creative about solving these problems because for us it's not just getting the end product in many cases it's how can we get the end product with xyz um, restrictions just like you said and so mm -hmm. yeah we're, we're consulting with with pharmaceutical companies they're bringing us their problems and then we are trying to uh, solve them so I think what what we wanted to cover has been covered in this segment. So we're going to jump into our last commercial break. And then when we come back for segment three, we're going to be talking about lab management, something that I have a little bit of experience of, but obviously Tamara knows way more than I do. So we're going to talk about that when we come back. We're back. This is the last segment. Yeah, it's been fun talking about the history of chemistry, what chemistry is, O-chem. Now we're going to talk about lab management. And really like I coined it as lab management and steam because of course this is everything steam and yeah, you're going to have to deal with art being in, you know, in the acronym, just saying, but yeah, we're going to be talking about the role in that, that like a lab manager has to succumb to what they have to deal with, what they see, et cetera. And we're going to end this with a, with a fun little note you know, discussing the difference between what you see in movies and, and what you get in real life, movies, TV shows, whatever, anything in pop culture versus what's right. real. Yeah. 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 So I've only, I've had a limited amount of experience doing lab management, but of course we're talking to somebody who is a lab manager. So tomorrow let's run me through what you got. What are you dealing with? So yeah, I try to, I try to frame it as what I get to deal with. Positive That's fair. Just, we're doing this. So my role as a lab manager is essentially I'm like the landing page of the lab. Any and all 
issues that come up are under my purview and I am actively dealing with issues that are like in the present and planning for issues that come up in the future while also making sure that everybody in our lab has what they need to do their jobs effectively. So I'm sort of, I like to say that I'm the glue that keeps the lab together in some ways, just lubricant on the, on the gears, making sure that this machine is running. Mm -hmm. So that's, I guess, all the analogies I have for lab management. Um, but yeah, in terms of like day to day, people have asked me this before and it's like really hard for me to define what my day looks like because it's so variable. So many different things can pop up um, from one day to the next and nothing really looks the same. I would say that the most consistent thing is that I, I order stuff and materials and consumables for people. That is the only consistent thing that I can count on. <laughs> Otherwise it's like, oh, this instrument is not working today. Can you troubleshoot it? Oh, this, you know, I spilled this chemical. Can you like figure out how to clean it up? Or like, oh, there's a, a, a safety hazard. We need help with that. Figure it out. Uh, there was a fire, there was an explosion, there was, you know, I need this new thing. I need to um, analyze this molecule and I don't really know how. Can you maybe help me understand it a little bit better? Mm -hmm. So everything, I try I try my best to be sort of knowledgeable as about as much as I can. And I'm constantly learning. Like these people are constantly teaching me new things about doing chemistry, about the needs of chemistry, about just all the little nuances of like how to make their lives better. So I'm constantly learning uh, at the same time that I'm also constantly trying to help these people. So it's a very rewarding, very fast paced, very um, interesting job, I would say. That seems pretty similar to what I had to deal with. Uh, I would say mine, so mine was at the, the academic level. I was a host manager of a 3D printing lab. I uh, I just kind of thought it was cool, got into it. I was 3D printing just like as a protege and just really interested in in the whole aspect of it, the engineering behind it and stuff. And then uh, a person that was running it prior to me was like, Do you, are you interested in, in taking it over? And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? And uh, yeah. yeah, let's do it. Yeah, so I was doing a lot of the managerial stuff like what you were saying, but I was also teaching safety procedure teaching mm -hmm. how to uh, effectively take apart like extruders or, or take apart like different portions of the printers and you know in a proper way putting it back together teaching people how to tr troubleshoot with the machine with the machinery um, also with the software involved and stuff like if, mm -hmm. if people wanted to know how to do different slices or or just even like support structures and stuff. I, I was there to help with that. But then I also uh, at the same time was acting as, you know, a bit of a researcher in terms of what materials we could house, how we could house them, how we could keep them airtight. Um, what are the parameters? Like what I did was I made a selection chart. Like if you wanted to do such and such, uh, of a print, then you want this sort of material at this temperature for this bed setting for um, this, you know, I guess, filament output, et cetera. And then this is how you should store it. And I made spreadsheets on that and it, it kind of in that in that aspect. But then I also had a good deal with like what needed to be ordered, of course, like the then the managerial aspect of things, right. making sure supplies. side of management. <laughs> yeah. Weird thing though is like it, in in cadence with like the department, I was also kind of like so for a while it was kind of full access to people, but mm -hmm. then we transitioned to an area in which it was locked from the general populace of the department. So you had to get access. So <laughs> then we had then I had to deal with like access and making sure I was there for certain people because like when it, before we did that transition people would come in they would print they put on like a 20-hour print leave 
And then I'd come back and there would just be a globular mess oh, no. and I would have to fix it. And I'm just like, there's no more of this. This is right. not happening. Not if right. I'm running this place. Right. Right. But yeah. Um, just, I, I wouldn't say like on, on your level, it's different. Like you're the professional level. My level was more like, you know, irresponsibility or just like a lack of lack of care or just like a lack of knowledge. I mean, I'm sure it's a little bit of everything, but yeah, it always amounted to something where <laughs> well, you just whenever you're walk. dealing with students learning, you have to make a lot of leeway for mistakes to be made. Mm, and yeah. that, that is something I've learned in my various jobs. I had a career, short career as a high school teacher. And then I also did a little bit of management in an academic setting. And I, I'm still technically in an academic setting. Like Scripps Lab is partially a grad student. Um, we have tons of, tons. We have 10, I think, currently grad students. Um, so there, there's definitely a lot of learning happening. And that is part of understanding your role as a manager is it's not like an industrial position where it's like all of these rules and regulations are in place and you're expected to do your job to this level of, understanding and if you don't they hear the consequences or mm -hmm. whatever in a learning environment you do have to understand that there is more grace required and more leeway for people to make mistakes and that does make it a little bit more challenging because you're not the rules aren't always so black and white and you have to be very very understanding of like this is you want to have a balance between structure and you still want chaos you still want just enough <laughs> chaos that there is learning happening and there's a freedom to sort of make mistakes and that i think is is a very unique aspect of the job that i'm in currently so yeah i have yeah. a little taste of the <laughs> frustration that comes with working with people that are learning <laughs> oh of course of course but you know it's, it's also a lot of fun uh, i guess to learn with or or teach somebody how things are are kind of going. It's it's always yeah. inter it was always interesting. Even when a professor would stop by and be like, like, how do you do this? And, yeah. and I like teach them. It's like, wow, I'm teaching a professor. It's pretty dope. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, overall, like uh, we also had we also had the opportunity to like build 3D scanners and and computers and and do different like types of like Raspbian code for coding for different. Um, for different printers and stuff like that. So there was the engineering, there was it aspect into it as well as the the managerial which was really fun. So it was it was it was cool. Like I like yeah. if anybody could could run a 3D printing lab, I I would say do it like because it is just all around interesting. Like if you want a piece of and then you could be like, you know, I really liked the research aspect. I really like the managerial aspect to this. I really like the engineering versus like the coding or something right. it, it kind of helps yeah, out great like, exposure to like all the different sort of avenues you can you can take and learn and i think that's also one of the best things <laughs> we're not really talking about management anymore but we're talking more about like personal career development i would definitely say you want to take on those opportunities as much as possible because especially younger students or like students maybe entering the workforce early career people it's just stay stay curious about like what the opportunity allows for you to learn and do because you don't necessarily know you don't like something until maybe you've tested a little bit and you're like, oh, here's a cool experience. I didn't even know that you could do that. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like a really, like you wear a lot of hats, I will say. Yeah. And that allows you to sort of explore those things a little bit more. So, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I highly recommend it. I mean, anybody gets an opportunity to do any sort of managerial work, especially like even in college or or what have you. I think it's a good way to uh, build a personality or build a professional rapport because you're always dealing with people uh, socially or and through like the work that they have to do. So it's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to, you learn a lot about yourself when you're in that position because you have to explain things to people in a way that maybe you don't necessarily understand it best yourself. Like you have to learn to work with people. You have to learn to work with order. You have to learn to work with just like keeping things running, which as a user, you sometimes lose a little bit of appreciation for. Whereas a manager, when you see and you have to touch everything and you have to be the one that like 
fixes the bad print for the person <laughs> who just left and walked away, right? You are intimately in tune with how the machine runs. And that mm -hmm. gives you such a deep appreciation for when you're participating in it, for when there's good systems, bad systems, like, et cetera. So yeah, I would recommend it also if anyone has the opportunity. Absolutely. So the last portion we want to talk about before we end, end all, be all out of this <laughs> uh, conversation is how we compare pop culture laboratories versus the laboratories of um, you know, the what, real what, world. Yeah, what we've seen. <laughs> and and for all of you British people out there, the laboratories. So <laughs> Dexter's laboratory. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Some old school throwback cartoon network. <laughs> so what what comes to your mind? Like what do you think are the key differences? I mean, a few things pop into my mind, but what comes to yours? Yeah. So I will speak on research and development labs because that's the type of lab that I'm in. I can't say that, you know, clinical or regulatory labs are sort of in my purview, but I will say from my experience, I've worked in a government lab, I've worked in an academic lab, I've worked in uh, an R&D sort of cross blend industry academic lab. Uh, the biggest takeaway for me is how much more chaotic and messy and disorganized and <laughs> just like crazy things are in real life versus what you see in the movies or on TV. Like there will be scenes in movies where somebody will like discover something, work it up, make the, the molecule, the antibody the, to cure all everything in like five seconds, the lab is pristine. There's not a drop on their lab coat and they turn around and they just are like, boom, I got it in a day. <laughs> and we're like, okay, well, first I got to find the reagent. Then I got to set up this reaction. And like, maybe that'll be the course of a few hours <laughs> to a day. And it's just, it's crazier. It's messier. It's way more time consuming in real life. There's just no amount of movie magic that could cover up the fact that real life chemistry, real life science just takes longer, requires a lot more chaos and is just, <laughs> I'm like laughing, even picturing the two things in my head. Cause every day I'm dealing with like mess and craziness and I'm imagining these pristine looking labs in, in movies. It's just a total difference. Oh yeah. It's yeah. I, difference. Yeah. I have like a, so maybe a good, I, I actually thought about this. So I don't know if you've watched The Martian. That's probably one of my yes. favorite oh, movies. Damn it. One of my favorite movies. <laughs> yes. So um, in in a scene where Donald Glover, he mm -hmm. was the dude was like, why don't we do, uh, why don't we do a gravitational assist to go back and get Mark Watney? And uh, whenever he was doing the calculations, if you remember his desk, that's kind of how I, think of desks in like a lab uh, a laboratory to look it up. <laughs> yeah, that's how i think of it and maybe even a little more like it, it just depends on what's going on also depends on the day right because sure. like we like we alluded to earlier you never know if you're going to be fixing three different pieces of equipment while answering two different questions while right. having people come in to be like hey teach me how this is working and while you're working on your own project and yeah. it's like you just got so much going on where mid tables are completely taken over. You have different references all over the place. I'm Your inventory. I'm looking at the picture of Donald Glover's desk, and it is so accurate. <laughs> just like piles everywhere, like the computer screen. Like you can barely find it through your through all the stuff. One hundred percent what it looks like. like I, my desk, I do try to keep neat, but in terms of like the lab benches, it's just. I don't know how people find stuff, honestly. <laughs> it's it's hard. I mean, it's hard to keep an inventory, especially when you have so many projects going on. I mean, yeah. that's that's in like in one laboratory, you can have multiple different projects, just people going crazy in all different yeah, avenues. I, our, so our lab is actually one of the the larger labs at Scripps. We have uh, around forty postdocs and graduate students, and we are operating forty fume hoods. And wow. 
all the thousands and thousands of chemicals and we go through inventory and consumables like water. We're just constantly, I mean, productive. It's good. It's really good. But in terms of pace, it's extremely fast. And Mm -hmm. in terms of numbers of projects and what's going on at any given time, it's dozens of projects and Mm -hmm. little things and individual people's needs and instruments to keep track of and just like various, like you said, various issues that come up. It's just a whole slew of what are we getting today? What's the roulette wheel tossing my direction? (laughs) Well, absolutely. And something that maybe isn't like portrayed like as like laboratories in the movies it's just the movement of people like what you were alluding to 40 different postdocs just like doing stuff like yeah. all over the place like that usually doesn't get shown very well like right. the, the chaos of motion like uh i was in a, a nano fabrication laboratory for a few months uh before i transitioned into engineering school which was a lot of fun i yeah, I was making uh, OECTs, uh, organic electrochemical transistors. Oh, yeah, very random because it, I'm a structural honestly, engineer. It sounds like the organic electrochemistry, like we're there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I was I was running a few spin coders. Yeah, okay. for sure. <laughs> uh, I was uh, putting down some some gold some gold coats. Yeah, yeah. and and you laser etching. Did you work in a clean room? I did. Oh, nice. You had the full bunny suit, the whole getup. Yep. <laughs> yes. So cool. it, it was a lot of fun. And now it's kind of weird because like working um, at, I can't say said, said fabrication facility, we're, we're engineering the structure of the building that which would have a nano fabrication laboratory laboratory ah. in that facility. But it's kind of weird how that kind of came well, around but, for you. Yeah. Yeah, but um, in that like in that facility, we there was also the thought of since you have all this traffic, you have all these people in there, you have to have certain equipment signed off. So you also have to have sign off sheets and keep track of that, or just say like you have discrepancies with people that that claimed this for this amount of time. And yeah, there's there's all different sorts of uh, chaos that goes on in terms of just trying to like have people using equipment that's that's wow. there. And and I would I would say the same is true for us in terms of docu like document control is essentially yeah. the idea here where we are running these experiments and our lab notebooks are supposed to be these accurate recordings of what is happening every day in the lab like what are you actually measuring what are you doing like what reactions are you running and that's such an important piece of the puzzle that is actually very very hard to manage because almost everybody has a different idea of how notebooks should be kept, how they should record their data, what amount of information should be put in. But at the end of the day, it's like, if you get audited, say we we made a, I don't know, somebody wanted to replicate one of our processes or the pharmaceutical companies that we're working with, they're like, we really need to see exactly what you ran, like X, Y, Z needs. If those aren't kept very well, it can be very like, one damning because it's like well did you even do this and how well did you do it (laughs) um but two it can be almost like like embarrassing if it's not kept well because it's like well how how can we have confidence that what we've done is accurate like document control is is so large so important for reproducibility if anything came into question if we published a paper for example and somebody was like well i don't think that those are accurate We have to be able to back it up and say like, well, these are the tests that we did. These are, you know, this is the document that was written up about it. This is, you know, the spectra. This is, you know, whatever, all the parameters and all of that needs to be really well kept because if not, and we can't defend it, then Mm -hmm. it can come under question as like, is it even real good science? Mm -hmm. That was not a bridge we want to ever cross. No. And that's it's about like what you can prove. It's what you can demonstrate. It's like you could have said you could have gotten that, but how can we know? How do we know? Right. And that's right. The right. You got to have that evidence. And that's also something that's not portrayed in movies. <laughs> so, boom, nailed it. Another one. So many real life things that are just the movies make science look so easy, 
And I'm sure that some people got invested and interested in saints because of a, you know, somebody that was portrayed on a TV show or a movie, that, like really they resonated with it. It's like, Oh, I want to be like that. Or, oh, that seems really cool. And then you get into science and you're actually doing it. And you're like, Oh, this is not, this is not what I thought it was. <laughs> Why does it feel like I have to write out a, a paper every time I want to do a calculation? Why can't I just do the calculation like right. you did Why in math? Why can't I just mess math? around and find out? <laughs> yeah. Why can't I just mess around and find out? <laughs> yeah, you got a, at least two different avenues of what lab management is like um, from more of the engineering perspective and the chemist perspective. So you're welcome. <laughs> Take with that as you and may. Also some lovely advice if you are interested in going into lab management. We both recommend it. Very uh enlightening career i would say yeah absolutely well tomorrow this has been wonderful i appreciate you being on the podcast this was a lot of fun and i hope people out there are more excited about chemistry i hope so too i hope it didn't scare anyone away any more people away from ochem but it is very fascinating there's a lot of value in it and it's a way to explore the world just be curious about atoms and molecules and that curiosity can guide a lot of really, really cool science. So well, thanks tomorrow. Thanks so much, Sam. It was an honor to be here. Thanks. Have a good one. That is all for this episode of Everything Steam. I just wanted to take a quick second and thank Tamara for taking the time to share her knowledge on chemistry and lab management. If you love chemistry, fun facts and art, I recommend you give her a follow like I did on Instagram and TikTok at chemistd. Additionally, her link is also on our website, everythingsteam.org. Just head to the Episodes tab, click on this episode's page, and there you will find what you're after. I would also love to mention my amazing team for their collective efforts to make this show happen. This podcast was edited by Ariel Piermont, marketed by Courtney Page, QC'd by Panya Pit Erickson, and our episode art was created by Gabrielle Edmiston. After the episode, please give our podcast a rating and review on whatever platform you get your podcasts on. We're always looking for feedback, and the rating would greatly help us out in the fight against the algorithms. Lastly, be sure to check us out on all the socials for podcast news, upcoming episodes, and fun Steam content. Just search Everything Steam on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Reddit to join in on the fun. Once again, thank you for tuning in to Everything Steam. I'm your host, Sam Stanford, and as always, stay curious.